So, I'm going to start off a little bit about myself. My name is Kyle Lee. I'm a roughly designer at GitHub. I would call myself roughly a designer because I've actually been writing Ruby for, yep, like that, yes, no, hello. Gotcha. Just keep going? All right. Uh, I just call myself roughly a designer because I've been actually writing Ruby for about six years and that's kind of how I got started designing was uh, building things and I wanted it to uh, look pretty. If you want to find me on the internet, my handle is pretty much Kaneith everywhere on Twitter, on GitHub, Flickr, anywhere you want to look, that's what you'll find. Uh, my blog is Warpspire and if you want to look at these uh, slides afterwards, I'll post them up and there will be a link here shortly after. So, I want to start off a little bit about what's important in life, right? My favorite beer. What is my favorite beer? Uh, and I tried to think about this a little bit. Dogfish 90 Minute IPA Woo! is an amazing beer. I love giving you guys a beer. Great beer. Excellent. Uh, the 120 Minute is also awesome, but I cannot drink that uh, lightly. I just have a couple of those and I'm pretty much done with it. Um, but the more I thought about it, I don't know. I love Firestone Double Barrel Ale. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have had that before, but it's a pretty delicious amberish ale. Uh, this is kind of what I grew up on. This is the first good beer I had, I think, uh, in college when I decided to actually pay more than 30 cents for a beer. But you know, I can kind of always go for a Blackview Porter. I uh, discovered this through my PDX friends a few years ago, and I love it. Um, and Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada is always there, right? It's at pretty much every bar, delicious pale ale, great thing. But uh, luckily for me, I don't have to choose. I work at a company where we have a four-tap kegerator and a uh, custom ingrained Octocat top. So uh, I'm kind of lucky like that. I guess I like that. Um, also, I like to fall in the snow a bit. I decided to learn how to snowboard this year, and I've been going up to Heavenly all the time. So uh, I think that's pretty much my talk, I think. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So if I'm a designer, what am I doing at a Ruby conference, right? That doesn't really make a lot of sense, I don't think. Uh, but the truth is, developers actually end up designing a lot of things, uh, even if they don't think they are. Uh, stuff like their documentation for Ruby gems, uh, things like admin sections for websites, mini apps and side projects, things that maybe your designer doesn't have time to help with, or maybe you're just doing it by yourself. Uh, the truth is that you actually end up doing a lot of design. But that's actually not a really good point, in that, I don't think. Uh, more importantly, designers versus developers is a false separation. Uh, it's really a spectrum. You cannot be a developer or a designer. You just kind of lie somewhere in between and you have skills that are better at different ends of it. Um, hello, there we go. Woo! <laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, design is just as important <laughs> as tech. Uh, it's all about the end product. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have an amazing technology infrastructure if the design doesn't look good and, the, uh, and your users don't enjoy it. So I really think that you should want to be a better designer. A lot of people talk about designers who can't code are worthless, but uh, how often do you hear developers who can't design are worthless? You don't hear that enough, and uh, I don't want to like insult too many people, but it's the same exact thing. When you say designer can't code and they're worthless, you might be thinking about yourself and be like, maybe I'm a developer who can't design. So you should want to be a better designer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you build better end products. So now I want to talk about a little bit like how I got into the design field. I guess how, we, how I became what everybody wants to call a designer. Um, I just wanted to build websites, right? I was in uh, like seventh grade and I thought Warcraft 2 was pretty much the most amazing thing on the planet. And uh, I wanted to share this with the whole world. And uh, websites were pretty awesome ways to do that. And so I wanted to build websites. And how do I do that? Steal everything. Uh, view source is a great way. Trying to uh, look at designs and just, I just, blatantly ripped off everything. Uh, I don't recommend that for uh, your work stuff, but it's a great way to learn, right? Uh, you just start stealing stuff and eventually you build up the, skill, the skills that you need to become a better designer. Um, and as I was stealing stuff, I realized that good design is really just kind of a collection of hacks. Maybe it's the way that my mind was working, and that's why I want to call it like design hacks for the pragmatic minded, because I'm a very pragmatic minded individual. I like simple rules that I can build on top of each other and apply all of the time. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. So what this talk is not about, it is not design theory, anything I learned in school, or really organized or coherent. This is just what it is. It's going to be a collection of hacks, right? Uh, some tips to polish your designs, uh, some quick things to make it look better, 
and a couple design strategies to hopefully give you a better understanding of where, um, where I'm thinking about when I'm designing websites. So let's start about type. And what I mean by type is fonts, the way that text is laid out, and everywhere. Um, good typography really is 90% what you aren't doing. Stop trying to be fancy. I think that trying to be fancy is the enemy of most developers when they're trying to make good typography. Classic fonts go long, long ways, right? Helvetica, Arial, Times New Roman, Georgia, Monaco, and Korea, those six fonts right there, you can make amazing interfaces with this. Uh, some of my favorite design websites on the internet right today use just these fonts. So don't try, and, don't try and be too fancy. Just because you have this awesome font somewhere that you can use through Typekit or something, maybe you don't have to use it. Start off with something simple and build from there. Um, instead of using different fonts, a, lot, a good thing that I like doing is playing with the font weights and styles. And when I mean styles, I mean italicized, underlined, uh, borders around it, things like that. It's easy and less risky. So here's a little piece that I like from Twitter.com, this little section. Uh, tweets containing, I don't like the functionality, but I like the design of it. Um, and how, what this really does is it's all Helvetica, it's all one font right here. Um, they use a lighter weight font for the beginning of this heading and a bold and just regular. So if you just mix and match different weights, it's very easy to get a coherent design and not that risky at all. Here's another thing, increase line height to improve readability. Standard line height is the, uh, is the distance between the lines of text. Uh, so the distance between the bottom of weird GitHub and the top of you probably know. Um, by default, browsers use a pretty compacted line height. And if you just increase it, it makes things a lot easier to view. So you can see as it switches back, when you increase the line height, you increase the space between. Um, it's not that noticeable on the slide because there's actually a, lot, a little bit of text and the font size is huge. But when you start talking about uh, smaller font sizes and longer line lengths, it really starts helping out. Here's another awesome thing. It's a, uh, it's a tool called a baseline grid. Um, and it's a great tool to align your type. I don't think you should be super obsessive about it, but it's a great tool. Uh, what is it? You line out a vertical grid. So I have a vertical grid here of 50 pixels. And you choose font sizes that fit within it, hopefully. So if you use font sizes of 100 pixels and 50 pixels, you're going to be able to spread things out really easily. But you're not mandated to do it. The idea is that you line up the baselines of the text to one of those grids everywhere. Uh, and if you do that with images and tables and borders, you get a really nice vertical rhythm to your, uh, to your designs that's, that's very easy to lay out like pragmatically. So now I want to talk a little bit about color. Um, color, of course, is a great way to highlight content, to make things stand out, to make people look at things. Um, it's also a great way to set expectations, right? When you see this text here, you see the blue text of GitHub Shop, you're probably going to want to link, you probably want to click on it. And that's of years and years of learned behavior that you see blue links on the internet probably mean you can click on it. But you can do this a lot more uh, throughout apps too by using specific colors to denote specific actions or specific functionality. So it's a great way to teach users what something might be. But using colors just for the sake of color can be actually pretty distracting and harmful. Uh, I like the colors here, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and so what I think is a great tool to do this is start your designs in grayscale. Make everything grayscale, build it out, and add color later. What that does is it kind of forces you to really think about why are you using color rather than I should probably just add some red to this design. Um, and that's a great tool, I think. I, like, I do this a lot. I'm probably guilty about staying, uh, staying on the grayscale sky a little bit too much, but uh, I guess that's kind of personal choice at that point. A lot of people, when they try to use color, <coughs> they use a colored background, and then they start putting great text and great borders around it. This is a super pet peeve of mine. I don't know if it's going to work out too well in this projector, but I guess we'll see. Um, Add some, some of the background hue to the text and the borders around your uh, around things. It really is a great small touch. And what it does is it makes it feel like you're using a darker version of the color rather than gray. And uh, a lot of this is just because people think, oh, black looks a little bit too black. I should reduce the contrast. And they take black to gray rather than black to a grayish blue. Um, so try that out on your designs or borders, text. It really helps out, I think. Um, 
if you ever play around with Photoshop or something, you wonder why do your why do your gradients look so drab, right? Everybody, it should be pretty easy. I just go in here and click gradient, and uh, I see all these awesome designs on the internet, and they're like very vibrant. But why does my stuff look so drabby? Uh, the secret is something called a color mode, right? Uh, blend mode. So blend modes choose how to apply one layer on top of another. So if you start with one layer of a black to white gradient, and below it you have blue, you can use something, this is an overlay blend mode, and it makes the color really vibrant. So if you look here, it's kind of drabby. You go over here, it's pretty vibrant uh, and kind of light. And uh, here's another example is color burn. It makes it even more like a rich color. So try out different blend modes when you're creating uh, when you're creating <coughs> gradients. I think you'll find out that you're going to be able to keep a lot more vibrant colors and a lot more uh, liveliness to your design. Um, in the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that adding black or white as a straight opacity to colors actually desaturates them. Uh, when you want to make them darker, you want to add black, and you also want to saturate it and make it a little bit more richer. And when you're adding white, you don't want to just pick, you don't want to uh, wash it out. You want to make sure that you're creating a lighter version of the color. Uh, so that's a great way to like play with gradients and make them a lot nicer looking. So cheating with stock icons and images. I think a lot of people are afraid to use stock icons and images. They think they're like a cheap or a coward's way out. That is not true at all. Um, stock icons are awesome. First off, salads are hilarious, right? And uh, they are a great way to spice up the morning pages. I don't know if you know this, but uh, single women love laughing alone with their salads. It's, uh, it's pretty sweet. But uh, just check out the restaurant websites. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But seriously, like, uh, OxyCat is a great example. OxyCat was something that uh, Tom Press Warner found on iStock Photo because he wanted to spice up the 404 page. And as it turns out, OptiCat has become a huge part of the GitHub brand, right? We have GitHub stick, we have OptiCat stickers, OptiCat shirts. We've uh, modified him. He's all over. So he's a very iconic piece of GitHub. But he started off as a stock, a little stock illustration that Tom was looking to uh, make a web page a little bit better. Um, another thing is icon sets. Icon sets are crazy cheap and crazy helpful for uh, for designs everywhere. You can use them in buttons. You can scale them up and use them as backgrounds, use them as infographics, and they're so, so useful. I highly recommend getting one. Um, as far as like how cheap, Pictos is a great example. 648 icons, right? And they come in PNG and vector formats, which means that you can scale them as big or as small you want. Uh, and they actually have some of them available as like a font face compatible font, so you can use them without using actual images, which is also awesome. But $240. Uh, think about how much you get paid, and think about how much that might be useful to you. And think that you might be able to use an icon set for like hundreds of projects, right? I bought my icons maybe like a year and a half ago, and I'm still using them. So it's a really good value. I highly recommend getting it just to make your, uh, it'll make things look a lot nicer, a lot easier without having to think, oh, should I, should I make a little icon that I'm going to draw in Photoshop, and it's probably going to suck. I suck at creating icons, and I've been doing this for a long time. And basically, your time is, be is better spent elsewhere. If you're not a great photographer, you're not like a super professional pro photographer, go look on iStock Photo and buy some photos. It's really not that big of a deal. All right, so as far as like a greater design concept, I guess spacing and alignment is one of those things that really makes a design look good. And it's one of the biggest problems I see with uh, things that I would like to call like developer design things is that they just don't, I don't know if you don't think about it or if you're not aware of what's going on, but it's really something that bothers me. Um, your text is really crying for padding. I see this all the time. It goes right up to the edges of your containers. Um, all you have to do here is bring text in a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of people kind of go crazy with the padding. They put too much in and they never know how, how much padding do you use. So, a great tool that I like to use when in doubt, wow, can you see anything there? That's crazy. Um, is to use equal padding on the left, on the sides, and on the top and the bottom, and make sure that the padding equals the margin, equals the font size. Great way to make things generally look good, and you don't have to try too hard. Yes? Is, is black on black considered good style? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw the important parts of it. Um, so grids are awesome. I don't know if you guys know too much about what a, what a grid is, but a lot of people think it's like a vertical and horizontal. That's kind of weird because 
On the web, when people are talking about grids, they're generally talking about just horizontal alignment, so just having vertical grid lines and aligning it that way. Uh, it's a lot like designing your, uh, creating designs with Legos, right? Legos was really easy to make things that were awesome and symmetrical, and very, and the reason was that things only snapped into place in certain parts, and that's what designing with grids is all about. Instead of having a pixel unit, you have maybe a 30 pixel unit with uh, set gaps in between, uh, in between elements, and it's a great way to just kind of like selectively build stuff and make it look very professional and aligned uh, without much effort at all. Speaking of alignment, please, just align things. Uh, I, don't know how, I don't even know how to say this. Alignment is not hard, it's not a special skill, it just takes effort. You just have to look at it and go, do these lines line up? Okay, line them up, there you go. Not that hard, please think about it. Look at your stuff. If it's off by five pixels and like on the jagged edge, that's just gonna, it's, it drives me it's insane. So, Another overarching kind of like a design concept I'd like to talk about is uh, something called visual hierarchy. Um, and visual hierarchy sounds really fancy, but really it's all about boxes within boxes. Um, and what I mean by that is that related elements should be grouped together. So here's an example thing. We have a little user box that might appear in the top of your website. You have the, uh, you have, uh, the user's avatar over here you know, their name, maybe some points that they've earned, and some links to the stuff. And why this is good visual hierarchy right here is that if you look at this block, the Octocat avatar really owns this block. It kind of starts it off and anchors it. So you should think that everything within this block is going to descend from that idea of what is anchoring it visually. Um, and if you look at it, these links at the bottom are only relevant to Scottacat, right? No one else is. No one else can. It, those links don't apply to anyone else on the website. They're specifically for him. Um, and always think about what owns the box, right? What if you uh, you see this extra space and go, you know what, I'm going to put a site search here. But it doesn't belong, right? Because it, it's not owned by Scottocat. This is something that's owned by the site. So that's what I mean by think about what owns the box and make sure that related elements are grouped together. <coughs> and again, UI design is really about a series of boxes within boxes. And I don't mean actual boxes. I don't mean squares. I mean boxed elements uh, visually. And that's really what visual hierarchy is all about. So here's a website, Tumblr. I don't know how many of you guys use it. But uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about what, uh, how they use visual hierarchy here. So if you look at this top header right here, we have the logo, which really anchors that top box that I'm talking about. And these global actions here, so dashboard, explore, uh, goodies, and account are all like different sections of the Tumblr website that you can go to. So they're really like global links that, uh, that anchor there. And if you look at this next box, really, this whole column right here is owned by the activity stream, which means that other things that are, people are posting and things that you're posting as well. Um, and that's really what you want to think about. Everything in that column should be owned by the activity stream. And so if you take it one more, down, one more box down, you see that this is a post by Pi here. And it's really owned by his avatar here. Uh, you have this post on the right, and if you hovered over his avatar, you'd actually get functions to follow, unfollow, things like that. Um, and if you go one more, you'll see within the box there are actually post-specific actions. You probably can't read that text, but it's a reply, reblog, and then an icon to like it, and an icon to uh, respond with a photo. But those are all post-specific. They're not related to Pi. They're not follow Pi. They are actually specific to the box, and that's because the post owns that box. So some tools to, uh, some like general concepts to make sure that your visual hierarchy is good on your pages. Write out an outline of your UI elements. This is how I start most of my designs, really, is opening up my Moleskine and writing down things like this. I'm going to write down header. What is the header going to have? It's going to have logo, global navigation, a user box. And then uh, another section might be the dashboard below it that I'm going to do. And it's going to have this activity stream and this repository list. Within those, it's going to have all these new elements. Um, why I like this, it really forces you to group related elements together. So when you're writing something down as a, high, as a tree list, it, it only makes sense to group related elements together. Whereas if you're given a giant monitor canvas to design something, it's really easy to group unrelated things together. Uh, and each of these trees is going to represent one of those visual boxes when you're done. So you can take out dashboard, and everything under that should be in a containing box somewhere. And everything under activity stream, my friend's actions and my actions should be within that box. So 
Maybe you have tabs for my transactions and my actions. Make sure those tabs are within the box of the dashboard somewhere or within the box of the activity stream. I see this a lot. People use global navigation as tabs for content that is only a part of the page. And it's kind of really annoying, but if you write it out as a tree, it kind of forces you to think, where should this stuff be grouped together? Another tool that I like is uh, something called the squish test. And uh, the, what the squish test is, is you take a screenshot of your design or a uh, cut from Photoshop or something, and you shrink it down. And when you shrink it down, you really get to force yourself to look at the elements and how they're grouped together rather than being able to read pieces of text. And the point is that you're going to obscure details here and, make, and see how the design kind of fits together. So maybe you have a thousand pixel wide uh, screenshot, you squish it down to 400 pixels and kind of look at it, see if it makes sense, uh, and it's a good, it's really good reality check on things. And it also helps you see uh, things like call to actions. And can you actually, is that really what is anchoring the, the page visually, the thing that I want it to be? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but this is a great pragmatic way to do that. So now I want to talk a little bit about how to improve your presentations, which is a pretty big pet peeve of mine coming to a lot of tech conferences, right? And so, what is, um, right, so increase your font size. I cannot go over this enough, right? You cannot have a font that is too big on a slide. Uh, make it bigger. If it doesn't stretch to the edges, you're probably doing something wrong here. Um, Along the lines of that, 80 characters is great for a text editor, terrible for slides. Seriously, if you have 80 characters, you're doing something terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, way too many. So, truncate strings. Do you know that Ruby code doesn't have to be accurate in slides? How about that? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. MRI is not embedded in the keynote. You can make Ruby wrong, and that's fine. You know, you can tell people your syntax is going to be a little bit wrong for the sake of shortening things. That's great. But you know, sometimes you do have a big block of code, and you kind of have to go through it. And this is a this is a terrible piece of code. Like it's a lot of it's very overwhelming visually and mentally to think about what this is doing. And how do you fix stuff like that? Step through one line at a time. So truncate things on the top and the bottom, um, and just go through one line at a time. This is a lot easier to describe things and help people remember how it works. So. Maybe you start off with a slide like this and say, you know what, don't worry about it, I'm going to step through it line by line. And then you start there and go through. Uh, think about it, it's really not that hard. Some simple rules as far as like uh, code goes, I think 40 characters wide is pretty much, a, it's a pretty good goal. I don't think you should ever go past like 60 or so. Um, and make the font and about four lines of code uh, vertically. If you have a lot of lines of code, it's not just about whether people can read it on the screen. A lot of it has to do with mental overhead. Uh, people are listening to what you're saying, trying to parse what you're saying, and they're trying to read code at the same time. They're probably going to fail somewhere. So if you only have about four lines of code, that's a pretty easy thing to keep in your head. Uh, create the font size as big as it will fit. You don't have to have the same size font on each and every slide. So if you have shorter code examples, make it bigger, just because it's going to be better. Always bigger fonts. And brevity over correctness. So like I was saying, there's no Ruby interpreter in Keynote. There's no reason it has to be syntactically correct. You just have to show people the idea of the Ruby that you're doing. And that's really important. So this is, right? Yeah, contrast. Contrast is awesome. Um, make, think, make sure your slides have good contrast. Um, do they look sleek? Increase the contrast, seriously. You, want, you don't want to do web design here. Web design is really geared towards people looking at monitors. Uh, projectors are going to mess up things. You've already seen how like crazy things are. This one's stretching stuff out wide. There's a little bit of red in there. It's kind of awesome. But you want to make sure that people can always read the main text or the main idea of what you're doing. Uh, and some ideas of how you accomplish that that I think Add a 75% white overlay to your slides as you're going through and see if you can see it. 75% might seem like a lot, but a lot of projectors suck. Uh, they'll either, either wash things out or not project it up. After you've done that, add a 75% black overlay to your slides and see if you can read what's going on. Um, and that's what that's going to do is that it's really easy to see contrast on monitors, but not on projectors. So seriously, Contrast, font size, code samples. Think about it in your presentations. So now maybe here's a collection of stuff, but really not. How do you become a better designer? 
Um, and this is something that's kind of weird for me because I never went to school for design. I never had any official classes, so I just kind of learned things by myself. Like I said, steal everything. Uh, try to recreate a button in uh, Photoshop, and then try and recreate it in CSS. Maybe try and create like an OSX style button, uh, and see how they're how the gradients are layered, how the highlights work, what styles they have on their text. Uh, and by going through these examples, it really it really forces you to learn how people create designs. And the more you steal, the more you understand the general concepts and hacks that you can collect together. Uh, try to build a website from a screenshot. So take a screenshot of it and try and rebuild it. See if you can actually recreate the visual styles yourself. Side projects. I'm a huge fan of side projects, whether it's your blog, a uh, gem, maybe a gems documentation page, but have side projects. The great thing is you can constantly redesign them. So when I was really trying to become a better designer, I'd probably design my blog about somewhere on average about 10 times a year, right? I'd re redesign it. And who cares? It's my blog. I get to do what I want. That's the glory of side projects. That it's really no risk, and it's a great way to experiment and learn. And again, practice, practice, practice. Uh, you're not going to become a better designer overnight. It's not something you can read a book and be a professional at. You just got to try and do it every day. So that's it. Um, Octocad stickers work awesome on snow. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So you talked a bit about color. You didn't talk about accessibility or dealing with people who are colorblind. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, a bit of a hobby horse I like to ride. I know there's some good tools on Macs in particular, I don't know about other platforms, <laughs> for viewing designs as if you were colorblind. Do you yeah. ever do that? Do you, do you pay attention to that? Is that something that you would talk about? Um, so one of those tools that I was talking about, start with grayscale and add color later. That's a great way to kind of sidestep that issue. Uh, the way that people are colorblind is that they see different hues as a different hue. So it might, uh, an orange and a green might look actually the same color. But when you start with grayscale, you force, to, you force yourself to design with a contrast, maybe a lighter gray and a darker gray. And if you have a light green and a dark orange and somebody who is colorblind to that, they're actually going to see the difference between that still because you're going to have different lightness of things. So that's another advantage of, I think, starting with grayscale and adding color later. Yeah? Uh, this might be a weird question, but I'm picked does the license follow the person that bought it? Like, as you go between projects and different side projects, do you use pick those icons? Like, like that? Yeah, generally, most of the most icon sets and uh, stock stuff is a per person usage. Uh, definitely read the licenses and see what you're doing. But the icon sets in particular are generally geared towards like freelance designers, and so they're very much like share between projects, but do not distribute them and sell them to other people. Yes. I'm going to take the opposite perspective of my friend here, Josh, and uh, talk about ask you about color on the other side, which is, have you ever read anything by Donald Knuth about the use of color in information theory? Probably not. You really ought to, because I think you get a lot of it. Okay. Excellent. And everyone else did. <laughs> Can you repeat that? Repeat what he was asking. He was saying that uh, Donald Knuth writes a lot about the uh, idea of uh, would you say color theory and uh, use of color and information? Use of color and information, uh, and it's a good resource to read about uh, how I guess I'm assuming how people react to color in design. Use less, but use it. Yes. There's the one sentence. <laughs> yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about any uh, any hints or tips you have as far as using progressive disclosure to reveal sort of depths of information? Because um, I noticed I noticed GitHub has done a couple of interesting things with that. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, clicking on source files and having that sort of um, slide in from the right. Um, just curious if that plays a role. Do you mean? Um, do you mean like? I guess there's two different uh, ideas of progressive disclosure to me. Uh, one of them is like hiding elements and like collapsing them, and then expanding them later. Mm -hmm. Or are you? I'm not I, sure. I would just say any sort of element in the page that that reveals other information that you don't see initially. Gotcha. Um, a good tool of that is uh, using kind of first run things. So I don't know if you've used the GitHub file finder, but the first time you use it, uh, there's a little banner that shows up that explains what it is. And then you can click X and it never shows again. Uh, that's a really good tool, I think, for application design is showing little tool tips and over help people in the beginning and then allow them to hide it forever and never show again. Uh, 
in general, I like to over-disclose at first because uh, people will expand things by default and then make them collapse it the first time, and then maybe subsequent things are collapsed. But if you show things at first, it forces people to see what it is. And it's a lot easier, I guess, mentally to collapse something because you want it to go away than to expand something that you don't know if there's stuff below it. Yeah? You spoke briefly about uh, font weight and font style and the like, line height mm -hmm. and character width being a way to uh, um, your style of body. What do you think the role of head shadow is? Do you think the like head shadow is the body content of that? Um, it really depends, I guess, on the visual style of what you're doing. So, Can you repeat? Yes, he was asking uh, what the role of text shadow plays uh, inside of making things easier to read and such. Um, a really good example is using light text, so white text on top of a dark, uh, a darkish gradient background button. Uh, if you use that, it's actually kind of hard to read, but it turns out if you add a text shadow which is actually negative, so it's going up and to the left and it's hard, it kind of gives this idea that it's chiseled in to the button. And the end result is that it actually makes it much easier to read. And by the same vein, you can use uh, a text shadow, a dark text shadow, on top of the light button to actually make the text like easier to read. Um, but you want to make sure a lot of people use text shadow kind of like, and it ends up just making it blurry. Uh, if you're just using this really light gray text shadow on a white background with black text, it's just going to make things blurrier. So as far as like making it easier to read, I say just look at it and try it out. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people recently style uh, key tags with like, this light text shadow, I guess make it feel like a different font even though it's not. Yeah. And sometimes they can see feel like it's a little too blurry. Yeah, definitely. Just be careful with that stuff, I guess. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you guys.